antlers, assumptions, and artillery. Holly had been mostly all right. At Bjorn's insistence, which was entirely him asking about once an hour about it, Holly had gone to speak with her psychologist. It hadn't been a long session, but it had helped. Now, however, was a bit of a happier time. The civilian access areas of the undaunted arcology had been given a walkthrough. There had been several hours of swimming and relaxing by a pool. Plenty of exercise. And Bjorn had used his access to escort both Holly and Martha through the vehicle bay so Holly could see the bigger toys and Martha could gawk at the armor like she was in a museum. She had also asked for permission to take pictures, which she received. A bit of fast talking on Bjorn's part, and there were now several images of Holly holding up APCs in a military press full of recruits who are all cheering at the sight, which escalated into an image of Bjorn doing so with one hand. A lot of ridiculous photos later, and the last one was of them arm wrestling with steel plating as the table between them. Steel plating that was visibly deforming under the sheer pressure they were putting it under. They were all just killing time until tonight though. The planet was soon to leave the danger zone near the Axiom Lane, which mean that there was a once every 200 years celebration about to kick off. Bjorn had felt like an idiot for not knowing, but justified it on account of being new to the world and busy. Holly had used his excuse, and Irma, Vera, Lils, and Silas had all just laughed a bit and explained that it wasn't really a tourist thing because of the null cascades that happened beforehand. But it's an excuse to party, so it's a party. Now things are more revving up and the undaunted were caught partially out of the party, mostly because there was still work to do. But Bjorn isn't on those teams. Bjorn is on bodyguard duty, which means that he's sticking with Holly, who's taking her mother and her friends and going to a distant arcology that's long been in competition with its fellows for who can throw the best party. The entire cluster is apparently nothing short of insane every 200 years, and it's not a party to miss. So they're all back in their party clothes as they step out of the checked out minivan. Not the most flattering transport, but it's got an engine that can break orbit. Enough shields that you'll need plasma to slag it, and the armor reinforcement means you'll need at least two plasma shots to actually kill it. Never let it be said that the undaunted go around without their own sense of style. Has war been declared? Did your starfighter misplace its cannons? The Agila guarding the door demands. Darling! When you're this much woman, you need a tank, Holly declares, opening the door, and the taller Agela snorts. Oh, really? Well, let's just see, she says, walking up with a rhythmic clopping of her hooves. Holly matches it, and the Agila kneels down before holding out her arm and flexing. Definition pops, and the larger alien nods. Then Holly flexes, and the Agila's eyebrows pop up in surprise. Whole lot of meat on the bone there, but this is a party where a certain kind of guest is... She begins to say before Vera, Lils, Salas, and Irma emerge surrounding Bjorn and escort him up to her. He looks up at her and tilts his shades down to look the Agala right in the eyes. So is this a flex pass system? Because I've got flex aplenty. He says before taking on a strongman pose and ripping the thin t-shirt he has on. His actual outfit is just the pants and boots tonight. He does, however, have a whole series of two tight t-shirts that exist only to be ripped off with a single flex plus an armory in his cargo pockets, just in case. Well, damn, that's enough flex for you and entire hives, she notes. Hives, Bjorn asks. Don't you know, Hive Maleta is catering tonight's celebrations. Everything is going to be so fresh, the veggies will still be downright growing on the table and everything cooked to perfection. Busy little girls are downright obsessed with having the best food possible. I think we buy most of our food from Hive Malata, Bjorn notes before grinning which means tonight is where they've been keeping the good stuff. Glad to hear it. Get on in, we have a, uh, huh. You don't look like you fit in as much, the bouncer says, getting into Martha's way and looking her up and down. Mother comes with us, Bjorn says, pushing the bouncer to the side, and she skids across the floor on her hooves. Oh, strong and assertive. Not just one of those boys that pumps Axiom into their muscles to inflate, are you? The bouncer asks. Easy way's boring, Bjorn says. I don't need Axiom or the engine to move that van where I want to. I believe it, and I suppose that is enough flex for her too. Go on in, Mams and Sir, the Agula says. Try not to have too much fun in there. 
No such thing, Holly calls up, and the force field cutting them off from the party goes down and lets the strangely mixed music pour in. What kind of music is this? Fairy tale gothic techno? What? Bjorn mutters as they walk in. He's already slipped on another too tight t shirt for the next flex. It doesn't really limit his movement, but it does at the same time. At least if he wants to resist ripping it into tiny tatters. Body paint would be less skin tight. It's actually sinking in a touch. It's a bit different than what was expected, though. While there are clubbing spaces and dance floors where they'd all blend in, it's side by side to places with goofy little games and stalls that have children playing at them and winning little stuffy prizes or the like. It's a party crossed with a festival and a carnival, and it looks like a holographic circus is kicking off as partially transparent animals walk along the walls to show off tricks as if they were on the ground. Wow, Bjorn notes as he looks around. They threw everything at the wall to see what would stick, didn't they? No, the holograms are on the walls and, oh, that's a human expression, right? Yes, it means they're trying everything to see what works. He says is on the wall, an elephant with its tusk coming out of its trunk, like a spear anchors itself with its trunk and starts balancing on its hind legs. What is that thing called anyways? I think its name translates to spear nose, Martha remarks, following his gaze. And what's it called at home? Hazwaza Darazadaz, Martha says. Spear nose it is, he says. Okay, so, before he can ask who wants to go where first, Vera grabs him by the wrist and starts yanking him to the side, and he just lets her lead even as the other girls keep pace around him. To his amusement, they pass another crowd like themselves, albeit much larger, that has a Koiran man that looks more like a bipedal terrier puppy being carried by a Canador woman in the center. They're heading the opposite way. They try a couple of games, but between Bjorn's training and Holly's sheer strength, well, they both get some gigantic stuffed animals tossed at them and then banned from playing any further, leaving Vera, Lils, Salas, and Irma to earn a collection of smaller ones. For some reason, the locals have made stuffies of the tundra worms, and Bjorn can kind of assume they're all right when their teeth are just stitched on bits of cloth in a circular pattern and not serrated in hooked nightmares designed to hold on and allow the meat to go one way as the topmost set saws away at whatever it has a chunk of. Beyond the simple tooth design, they're just long white tubes filled with stuffing. So why do you think they've made toys of the worms? Ease, Bjorn asks. That, and for a lot of us, it helps, Lil says. Helps how? Not all of us are big strapping apex predators, you know. Some of us have a fear of being eaten. Lil says as she holds up the worm plush she won at a beanbag toss. This, it makes the things between the arcologies seem less scary, but maybe too much. I'm sure someone has a story about, Bjorn begins and Sala snorts. You have a story about this. I had Mr. Wiggles as a little girl, I thought that the pillow was really what the real worms were like. I got my first restorative coma as an answer. That bad? Holly asks. Well, without the coma, I wouldn't have my lovely tail, or my butt for that matter. It got me good, she says as she holds up Lilsa's plush worm. She had made a point of getting something that more resembled a plush kitten. The fear took longer than the scars to move past. Considering they were probably over and done with in 48 hours, I'm not surprised. Martha remarks, is there anything in particular that helped you move past it, young lady? Or did it just fade with time? Bit of both. I let it fade for a while before I made a point of going out and watching a few culling campaigns on the evil things. I was even allowed to push the big red button on one occasion. Killed a thousand of them. That had really helped, Silas says as she looks the worm right in the face and then snorts before handing it back to Lil's. They're not very scary to a grown woman, but a little girl is in trouble. Bjorn puts an arm around her shoulders. Tail or not, you're still a catch and a half. I'm glad you're better. Want to see if I can't get you to pull a trigger or two on the next bit of indirect fire training? Maybe call out a range so your words alone bring death to them. Ew, no, I'm not like you, big man. I've got no taste for blood. I don't even really like the smell of that bacon stuff you love. It's why I don't cook it when you're over. When you're gone, I eat it by the pound, Bjorn says. Thanks for that, by the way, Lil says. You know it's safe for you girls to digest, right? The type I've got doesn't have any additives or anything of the sort. It's just straight meat. Oh, we know, it's just that. 
I don't know. The idea that what I eat felt pain to get there? The eggs are cutting it close with the fact that they're infertile. But something dying for me to have a meal? No, Vera says. Suit yourself. Although most meat animals would have been driven to extinction to keep them out of fields otherwise, and Bjorn is cut off when a chime rings out. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the ceiling. The night sky celebrations are about to begin. They're starting early this time, Irma exclaims as everyone looks up. There is a flash of light as a firework is set off without any clear path from where it came from. There are several more, white and yellow and blue in rapid succession with glorious booms of noise. As they're looking up, Martha gives Bjorn a tap and he crouches slightly so that he's at a level where she can whisper in his ear. They contacted me during our trip to this arcology, she says. Can you narrow that down? Those girls that thought my Holly was that thing, she says, and he frowns. May I see your communicator? He asks, and as a series of drones light up and begin to weave among the fireworks to display a moving image coupled with holographic birds in flight. He quickly checks the text that Martha brings up and frowns. I'll inform my superiors. An attitude like that is going to get someone killed. He whispers to Martha. The text by itself was an empty threat, but they had sent it to Martha, and if they have a brain, they'll check where she is by pinging her communicator, maybe even finding Holly through it. Words are worthless. Innocence proves nothing. If words mean nothing, then his bullets will have something to say. And if innocence isn't enough, then no amount of justice is either. 